Hey everyone, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be joining us from today. Welcome to today's webinar co-hosted by the New York Oracle User Group and Oracle Partner Viscosity North America. We've got a full virtual house today for our presentation by Oracle Ace, Gary Gordhammer. So I am expecting to see some great questions from the audience today for Gary. We are live, so feel free to submit questions throughout today's session. My name is Monica Lee. I'm marketing director here at Viscosity, a full Oracle stack consulting firm that you'll hear about a little more in a bit. Um, before I get to that, a couple housekeeping rules. We've got a questions panel for you. And feel free, like I said before, to submit questions here. Gary will get to the questions as he can throughout his webinar and also following the webinar. Um, if you have any other questions that are non-technical, you can also put them there and I or Katie will try to get back to you and help you out with anything we can. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Coleman from NYOUG. Welcome everybody and thanks uh, Viscosity for co-hosting this uh, series of webinar with the New York Oracle Users Group. Uh, as you know, uh, New York Oracle Users Group was formed in 1984 for the exchange of ideas, assistance, and support among users of Oracle software products. You can connect with us on Twitter, Meetup, LinkedIn, Facebook, and of course our website is nyoug.org where this uh, presentation by Gary Gordhammer will be posted as well as the PDF and the MP4 also. And I understand he's got a lot of um, Git informa GitHub information that'll be posted as well. So stay tuned for nyoug.org uh, when the information appears. And thank you, Viscosity North America, for co-hosting this series of webinars with us. Thank you, Coleman, and we love co-hosting with you. Let me pull up this screen here. And while I do that, um, for all of our new uh, comers. Just remember, this is a live webinar. Submit your questions as you can. And before we get started, a quick little message from Katie Barnes from Viscosity. Thanks, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, my name is Katie Barnes, account manager here at Viscosity. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I'm going to introduce you guys to Viscosity and go over some of our different areas of expertise. Viscosity is an Oracle partner. We work very closely with Oracle product management and we have four Oracle ACEs among our leadership. At our core, we help businesses adapt and thrive with the changing needs, demands, and technologies that businesses face. Many Oracle customers are increasingly relying on professional service partners like ourselves to serve as trusted advisors and to help make better purchasing decisions in an area that is constantly evolving. Our business model at Viscosity is designed to implement technologies and solutions that will ensure your challenges and goals are met with. And we do this by building close relationships with individuals like yourself, being an open and honest resource, and showcasing our different areas of expertise through our webinars and workshops like the one you're about to watch today. <clears throat> So our areas of expertise really fall under these three pillars, data apps and infrastructure. A large bulk of our business is on the database side, including data integration, data warehousing, zero downtime migration to latest versions, including 19C. And overall, we help improve performance at the database level. In our applications practice, we do a lot of APEX development, EPM, ERP, we develop custom apps. And lastly, our infrastructure and hardware practice includes Oracle's public cloud offering, bare metal, engineered systems. And um, we were actually named Oracle's ODA partner of the year back in 2019. So as you can see, we're very active and recognized within the Oracle community. We do pretty much everything when it comes to Oracle, but these are some of our more broadened areas of expertise. As I just mentioned, we have a very close relationship with Oracle and the people that you see here on this slide represent some of Viscosity's leaders and our Oracle aces. These guys present at Open World and Oracle user group conferences all over conferences all over the globe. Um, they are eager to meet with you and your team and help uncover how we can best support you. Trust me when I say there's nothing better than having four aces in your hand. 
So this slide showcases some of our other services and I'll just briefly go over a few of them. In our team at Viscosity, we have experts on Oracle license management that have actually come from Oracle and worked in that space for several years. We provide all of our customers with the best knowledge and the best practices on how to manage and maximize your Oracle investment which is obviously extremely important for businesses. Um, we are probably most known for our zero downtime migrations and upgrade services. We've helped customers migrate from AIX to Linux with zero downtime. And more recently, we've been helping our customers with upgrading to Oracle 19C. With our performance health checks, we can fix pain points before they become real problems for our customers. Um, definitely another popular service of ours. And lastly, we have a full stack of DBA services as well. If you have any questions about our services, please reach out to one of us. We're always happy to answer any questions that you might have. I wanted to showcase the work that Viscosity has put into becoming trusted advisors who have actually written the books on Oracle's latest technologies and versions, anything from virtualization, pluggable databases to Oracle Exadata. If any of the books that you see on this slide interest you or if you're interested with connecting with one of us, uh, again, please reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to share resources with you and your team. Alrighty, last slide before I introduce today's speaker. If you haven't already checked out our events page, please do so using the URL that you see here, viscosityna.com slash event. We update this page on a monthly basis with our webinars, workshops, and other events that we have going on, and it is a really great resource. Um, just a reminder, I will be sending out a copy of the slides and a recording of today's presentation to everyone later this afternoon, so just be on the lookout for an email from me. Um, sometimes they can go into your junk or spam folder, so just be aware of that and if you have any questions in the meantime please email me directly my email address is here at the bottom of this slide so now let's go ahead and introduce today's speaker today we have oracle ace and managing principal consultant at viscosity gary gorehammer gary is well recognized within the oracle community with over 25 years of experience with oracle database and related technologies you guys are definitely in great hands for today's presentation so without further ado i will go ahead and hand it over to him Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Monica and Coleman for those introductions. Um, so yes, uh, we're gonna talk about tuning SQL today. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me good. Um, if you have questions, just pop them into the question box. We will try to get to those as we go. Um, I probably do have a little bit too much content for the time. So if we are missing some stuff, we'll probably skip a slide or two, but uh, you know, we'll just try to keep things moving here. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. Uh, some of you are taking your lunch time, I know, and some of you are probably skipping the uh, Apple event so you can learn about tuning SQL. So hopefully we can make this a great uh, session for you. Um, I, I just want to quickly mention here, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. If you want to reach out to me, I'm on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and I have a blog. So feel free to reach out to me with questions, etc. cetera. Um, very active member of the Oracle user community and uh, Oracle Ace, as Katie mentioned. <clears throat> Um, I am working on a book, the book in the middle there, Performance Tuning. So uh, it's slowly getting closer, but it's not, we don't have a release date yet, but we are working towards getting that uh, finished up. So uh, hopefully look for that in the near future. And finally, um, for this session, I put together a bunch of examples. So I'm not gonna be able to go through all the examples during the session, uh, but you can do these. Uh, these scripts are as is, use at your own, uh, you know, uh, risk. I would recommend putting these like on a Docker container. If you have a little uh, database in a Docker container, you can spin up, run these, throw out. Uh, personally, I use uh, virtual machines. I bring up a database, run through these things, and throw them out. So uh, just realize I've run through these multiple times, etc. So if you go to that uh, URL there on GitHub, or if you want to use this short link, the bit.ly, three lowercase t z d b e z if you go to that you should end up at this website this is github and this is the specific code for this session and down here you'll see a readme with instructions of how to download the code to your uh, little linux box and how to run through the steps um, all of this stuff represents things we're going to talk about uh, and I want to make sure you guys have real world examples of, of how to do some of this stuff and see it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about SQL tuning. Um, 
So SQL tuning is a big topic. We're not going to be able to cover every aspect of it. This presentation is new just for today. Uh, this is based on some of the information I've done over the last year on other tuning presentations. Um, but it's really kind of this first step. How do I identify a SQL statement that's performing poorly? And what are some of my options to do about that? Um, you know, SQL tuning is, is a very broad and wide topic. So what we're talking about here in the slide is that, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to fix a bad performing SQL, such as looking at the environment, statistics, indexes, structural changes, changing the SQL code itself, adding a hint, you could apply a SQL profile, you could create a SQL plan baseline, um, or you could create a SQL patch. So these are all things that can be done to change a SQL statement once you've identified it. But obviously the first step is to identify the SQL that's performing poorly. And then step two is to find out how to make it perform better. And then step three, finally apply a fix for that. Um, so really we're going to talk about step one and we're, we're going to kind of allude to some of these other steps and tools and things you can use to do that some of the other sessions i've done throughout the year are specific on those tools and i'm sure i'll be redoing those at uh, other conferences and things in the near future so uh you know don't feel like you're being left out um, i'm trying to highlight some of these things and really cover uh questions that have come up so let's jump in <clears throat> Your first step is finding the SQL statement. So how do we do this? Um, and I shouldn't say I'm surprised, but it's interesting to hear some of the questions from people when I give some of these talks um, and they ask very basic things, which is good. I mean, that's a good thing. We want new people to come into this environment. We want people to learn Oracle. We want people to feel comfortable and know how to do these things. Uh, some of us like myself that have been doing this for 30 years, you know, we don't think twice, you know, it's kind of like getting in the car and driving out the garage and down your driveway. You don't even put much thought into it. You just do it because it's muscle memory. And so it's important that, you know, those of us that this is just muscle memory for that we get out and help train the new people and help give as much guidance and wisdom as we can. Um, so if you're looking for SQL statements, there's really three places in Oracle to find them. Uh, the first is the cursor cache, and this is what's in memory. So when you hit this uh, SQL view, V dollar SQL, or G, if you're on rack, G, V dollar SQL, uh, that view is what's in memory. So these are SQL statements that have recently run. In memory, they're cached, and this is the information about them that's available. Uh, things age out of cursor cache, right? You know, there's only so much memory. So if you have thousands and thousands of statements going through, uh, cursor cache are the ones that are most recently active, we would say, right? Um, so that is not everything on your system, but it is what's kind of running generally right now or in the recent history. If you have the diagnostic pack, then you probably have AWR reports. AWR reports also capture data from the cursor cache. They actually also capture SQL statements. They capture the top N statements and you can adjust how many they capture. Okay, so again, if you have a thousand statements in your cursor cache, the AW report maybe is running once an hour. At the top of that hour, it'll say, I'm gonna capture the top 10 statements in the last hour. The top 10 that use CPU, the top 10 that did disk reads, et cetera. There's a, there's a handful of metrics it uses. And you can adjust that. If you want the top 100, you can tell it to capture the top 100 or 200, et cetera. Um, and those are very good things to do. I, I highly recommend like a week before an upgrade, increase your top capture statements to like 100 if you haven't. And then maybe a week after the upgrade, lower it back down. So you have more data during that you know upgrade period where you're trying to review stuff and know what's going on. That's a very easy way to do that because these statements are stored on disk, right? AW reports are stored on disk. When you shut down your database or something ages out, whatever they are captured is still on disk. Finally, there's an area called ASH or active session history. This is also historical data about SQL statements. It is saved in SysOx. It uses the cursor cache and some of the AWR data, and it also has settings to adjust how much it holds, et cetera. Okay. So these are the three main places we are going to look for bad performing SQL statements. Um, so the again cursor cache is usually if you're using most of the performance tools you're starting at the cursor cache level you're looking at what's running in memory at that moment so let's talk about the cursor cache v dollar sql or gv dollar sql there's a few basic 
pieces of information you're going to need to know about this, right? So the first is the SQL ID. So the SQL ID is the unique ID number assigned to a SQL statement. It's based on the text, the actual text of the statement. If the text of the statement changes, you will get a new SQL ID, okay? So select employee name from employees where employee ID equals 10 is not the same statement as select employee name from employees table where SQL ID equals 11 because the text changed, that 10 became an 11, okay? Um, the same is if you do select employee name as emp from employee versus select employee name without the as, right? So you're just changing the text of the SQL, the SQL ID will change, okay? And uh, we'll get a little bit more of that, but changing SQL IDs means the optimizer treats it a little bit differently. Uh, SQL text is the first thousand characters of the SQL, right? So in that table, there's a column called SQL text. Um, and that first thousand characters can fit in that because it's a var care. So if you have a really big statement, you're not going to see the full text in that in that field. There's a second field called SQL full text, which is a clob, and it holds the entire text. Um, so if you run into a SQL statement where someone says, you know, select <clears throat> region name from regions, sales regions, where region ID in, and then there's a parentheses, and there's 10,000 region numbers in there, right? Um, that's not gonna fit into the thousand characters, but that clob will have the entire statement in it, okay? So if you're looking at something in a tool or something you're going, I'm only seeing part of the SQL statement, that's because of it's getting the SQL text, not the SQL full text, okay? Um, so then what you can do is grab that SQL ID, hop in to another tool and go ahead and grab the SQL full text from it, right? And get that whole thing. Uh, next is the plan hash value. So we'll talk about plans in just a little bit, but this is a representation of the execution plan. So when that statement was executed, there was a plan, a set of operations that was determined. And this plan hash value represents that, okay? So a plan hash value is unique to that SQL ID. And you can have more than one plan hash value because you can have more than one way to execute that statement. And we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, executions then is the number of times that that statement has run while it's been in the cache, okay? So if that statement come in Monday morning, that statement gets into the cache, runs all day, runs maybe a thousand times Monday, and then Monday at 6 p.m., it gets pushed out of the cache because there isn't room for it and there's other stuff going on. You come in Tuesday morning, that statement re-enters the cache, the execution count starts over. So this is the execution count since it's been in cache. And then finally, the optimizer cost is the what it believes, you know, an internal representation of how expensive it is to run that execution plan, right? So I mentioned that SQL can have more than one execution plan. Each execution plan can have more than one cost. And in some cases, the cost is not always accurate. And we'll, we'll talk about that. That's when we talk about things like bind peaking, okay? So here's a very simple example of querying uh, that V dollar SQL table. And I'm only talking about these columns at the moment. There's more, but these are the first ones to start with. You know, what is that SQL text? What user was running it? What is that unique SQL ID? The plan hash value? How many executions? This last active time? When was the last time I saw the SQL run execute? And then what was the cost? Um, and you'll notice like right here, I have two SQL IDs, the same SQL ID, because it's, it's the same statement, character for character, uh, but you'll notice there's two different execution plans, okay? And two different costs. And I'm just gonna caution you right now, you know, obviously a lot of tuning people look at that and go, well, the smaller cost should be the one I always wanna run because the more expensive cost must be bad. Um, I don't like to use the term good or bad, because you know, this is all situational, right? It all depends on what we're doing and, and we'll talk about more about what we're doing here shortly. Um, let me check the questions here. Uh, there was one about, do you need a license to generate AWRs? And yes, there's a diagnostic pack, a tuning slash diagnostic pack that is required to generate AWRs. Uh, okay, let's keep moving on this tuning topic. 
Okay, so some more things in that cursor cache. So besides just some basic info about the statement, you know, the name of it, the you know plan and the cost, what else can I find out? There's a whole bunch of other metrics in there that are useful. Um, and this is part of finding like what SQL is running bad. How do I make my system run better? Uh, so these columns, disk reads, direct reads, buffer gets, physical read, this is how much effort the database put into running that statement, right? So disk reads, these are blocks read from disk. So if you're using 8K blocks, this is how many 8K blocks were read from disk. Um, disk reads, these are reads that bypass the buffer cache. I'm sorry, direct reads, let me say that correctly, direct reads, these are reads that bypass the buffer cache. They went to the end of the most recently used. Um, they're better performance for full table scans, but they kind of aren't cached, right? So these are things you might wanna know. Buffer gets, so say, uh, and the query examples I'm using here, once you run them, they're small tables, they'll probably be in your buffer. You won't see a lot of disk reads, you'll see a lot of buffer gets. It's in memory, I'll do buffer gets. So uh, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Even full table scans can be nothing but buffer gets, right? Uh, physical read requests, physical write bytes. So this is any request to disk. So uh, the difference between disk reads and physical reads of disk read is a database block. I'm looking at row up. Um, if my read request for that block had to go to a control file to check the SCN of the file to make sure it's accurate before I read the block, the physical reads will monitor that and give you both those read requests in its metric, okay? Um, so this is getting some gory details. Uh, if it's over your head, that's fine, but just realize the difference here is disk reads is database blocks and physical reads is any read or any request that was required to make the, the SQL query get satisfied, okay? So maybe not just database blocks. Uh, CPU time is time in microseconds. Elapsed time is wall clock time. I started the statement, I started a stopwatch, I stopped the stopwatch, here's the time it took. And then cluster wait time, if you're running rack, this is how much it waited for the cluster. Hey, I need this block, I'm on node one, that block's on node three, uh, it's gonna take three milliseconds for node three to wake up and go, oh, you need this, uh, yeah, you can have it, right? That's cluster wait time. And there's more, I'm just giving you some highlights. These are probably places, if you're looking for bad SQL, you're probably gonna look for things that do a lot of disk reads or maybe beat up your buffer cache like crazy, right? Or do a lot of CPU time or take a long elapsed time. Why is the statement taking five seconds? The users are expected it to take one, right? So the reason I'm highlighting these because these are the pieces of data that you're gonna wanna start with. Um, and these metrics are cumulative. When I look at them in V$SQL, I mentioned on the first slide, it's the number of executions since it's been in the cache. So if you look at disk reads, it's total disk reads across all executions. If there's 500 executions and you wanna know how many reads there were per execution, you divide the disk reads by 500, okay? So really here, the point is, what is your pain point? If your users are waiting a long time, you're gonna look at elapsed time. If the CPU on the database is way too busy, you're gonna look at what's using the most CPU time or maybe the most buffer gets, right? Uh, if the disk subsystem is busy, too busy, you're always waiting on disk IO or waits, then you're gonna look at disk reads or directories, right? And if the cluster's too busy, you're gonna look at cluster wait time or your type wait time. So narrow down where your pain points are, and then that'll help you go look at the statements that are using the most of that, right? Um, so as an example, I ran a query, and this is in the examples in the GitHub. Um, Sorry, going the wrong direction. So this is a this is an example of a top SQL query, um, and you can see just the the SQL here, like the start of a SQL, the SQL ID, and then some of these metrics, right? How much CPU has it used? How much elapsed time? How many disk reads? How many buffer gets? The percentage of CPU. So this this query is pretty neat because it's actually not just saying I used. 30 milliseconds or uh, of CPU, it's saying this statement accounts for 0.52% of the CPU, right? So if you're looking for CPU offenders, you're probably gonna start with, well, what's using the most of my CPU, you know? So this is kind of a neat script, it's in the GitHub and you can run the same through these same examples and use it 
um, you know, for, for as you want. Um, the other thing I wanted to show is if you're not so much a SQL, you know, command line kind of person. So here is the OEM light, right? Like the performance hub. And if I go ahead and in my other window here, I'm going to go ahead and just kick off a bunch of SQL statements in my performance hub. We will start seeing these showing up and you'll start seeing load. And some of the same things I'm talking about are in the GUI tools, right? So <clears throat> if I look at this, it tells me this is how much CPU time was spent, how much concurrency, and I can narrow some of this down and click on the SQL ID and see some of the same metrics, right? So I'm, I'm trying to connect what you're seeing here. This data comes from the cursor cache. This is live viewing of that same data. Um, but sometimes, you know, what the, the views in these tools don't give you maybe the whole picture, right? If you're uh, looking for something specific. So a really good example of this is a SQL statement that changes its text every time, right? That one I gave where employee ID is equal to 11 versus 10. Maybe that statement's running a million times a day, but you're getting different SQL IDs all the time because that text is changing. How am I supposed to find that, right? Um, so using some queries of your own, you could look at like, show me all the statements where the first 50 characters of the statement are the same, things like that, right? And then you can sum up some of that data and get to those conclusions and go, oh, it's all different SQL IDs, but that is killing our system because it runs a million times a day uh, and total across those million runs, here's how much CPU or how much disk runs. So that's why I try to relate what you see in the tools, some of the backing, because the tools don't always bring all that together for you, okay? So let me grab a sip of water here. Um, okay. So I'm going to keep going and we'll try to share the link for the slides again at the end. I know they're going to send the PowerPoints out, et cetera. Okay. AWR, again, this is a license option, um, but the similar type information is stored in these tables called DBA underscore hist. Okay. So snapshots, DBA hist snapshots is every time an AWR snapshot is run, this keeps a record of it. At 11 p.m., I took a snapshot. Boom. And 11, uh, or I'm sorry, 12 p.m., I took a snapshot. Boom. Right. So record for each one. Hist SQL stat is when I took that snapshot, here's all the SQL top end statements I captured. Okay. So each SQL stat will be assigned to a snapshot ID, and then you'll have N number of statements that were captured, right? So if you said to capture the top 10, it'll capture 10 statements per one. Um, his SQL plans. So it actually captures the execution plans also. So for those statements, what was the execution plan at that time? realize execution plans can change. This is kind of some of the bane of the existence of a DBA, right? Monday, the SQL state was running one way. Tuesday, we ran a different way. Um, SQL hist, I'm sorry, hist SQL plan, hopefully we'll have that plan from Monday and maybe the one from Tuesday if it's in your top end statements. Uh, as I mentioned before, right before, like a week before an upgrade, I highly recommend taking this top end and making it like a hundred or something, you know? and capture your top 100 statements. And then when you do your upgrade, now you have more plan history. Now you have more tools in your tool belt to look at, uh, to, you know, to look at that. And then his SQL text is those full SQL text bits because that's a little bit bigger. So Oracle keeps that in a separate table. Um, and then stats data is total since there was in memory. So remember this stuff that's collected. I took a snapshot at 11 a.m. and then one at 12 p.m. The stats are that snapshot, right? So if that cursor came and went a couple times, et cetera, you know, not all this data is absolute perfect. That's why I'm trying to make sure you're clear on how data is collected. Um, if you have SQL statements leaving the cache all the time, then those those metrics get reset. Just realize that, okay? Um, so to change your retention or your interval or your top end SQL for AWR, we use the DBMS work rule repository modify snapshot settings. And top SQL is a setting that you can change how many top SQL statements. I believe the default is 10. Um, here's an example setting 30. Um, if I want, again, if I want 100, you can set this the week before your upgrade, wait till the week after your upgrade, set it back to 10 or 30, whatever. Uh, but at least then for that week, now you have a better picture of what was going on. 
Uh, interval is how frequently you take snapshots. Again, this is to me really more up to how uh, dynamic your system is, how much things change. That's kind of how your, your interval might help you. And then retention is how long do I want to keep that stuff? Um, I know customers that keep uh, 13 months worth. I know customers that keep uh, 14 days worth, right? So again, you know, it's really up to you and what's helpful for your, your position. But um, just want to make sure you're clear that these tools are out there to help you and you can adjust them to help you. Um, Okay, let's keep going here. Ash, active session history is stored in the DBA hist active session history. Collects information about SQL that has had more than one second of execution and is not idle. It maps the DBA hist ash snapshots for capture timings and the capture timings are related to your AWR capture timings, okay? So ash can have more detail, but again, don't expect to see everything in ash. Um, these are for statements that are really doing a lot of work. Uh, so notice that more than one second of execution, they've, they've, they're actively using CPU for more than one second. They're not idle um, and they have to be captured as part of your snapshots for your AWR, okay? Okay, um, so let me look quick. We're gonna have to move pretty quick here on some stuff, but let's see where we're at with questions. Um, okay, I think I answered most of these. What's the default number of statements captured? I think I answered that. Okay, um, so let's talk about the Oracle Optimizer. So I think this is a good, again, knowledge foundational. What does the Oracle Optimizer do? So say I'm headed to Chicago to the Museum of Science and Industry to see the Marvel Superheroes exhibit. And the Hulk's gonna meet me at the reception. I wanna be on time, right? He's not a guy you wanna make mad. So I'm probably gonna pull up Google Maps and find out the best way to get there, okay? And Google Maps is gonna do a lot of work for me, right? It's going to say, what's your starting point? What's your ending point? My goodness, look at all these road options, okay? There's the couple paths that's picked, but look at how many roads actually go from A to B. There's so many ways I could go to get there. Um, but it's going to look at like what's the speed on the roads with the distance. You notice like there's a, some other info here we'll talk about, but you know, it's trying to help me find the best way to get there on time, right? Okay. So let's keep this Google Maps idea in our head and let's talk about the Oracle Optimizer. Okay. So this is the basic steps of the Oracle Optimizer. You send a SQL statement in and the Oracle Optimizer parses it. So like in Google Maps, is this address valid? Do I know where it is, okay? So is your syntax valid? Does it look like a SQL statement? Semantic check. Are the objects you're referencing, do they exist? And does it match the names? If I'm asking for employee name from the employees table, is there a column called employee name? Does the employees table exist, et cetera? Then it's gonna do a shared pool check. Is this statement, here's the SQL ID I've generated, is a statement in my cache? If it's in my cache and I've seen it before, I'm gonna do a soft parse, grab the execution plan and go run it, okay? Because Oracle wants to do things quickly. It says, I've seen this before. I've made a list of instructions. I'm just gonna follow those instructions, okay? If it has not seen it before, we're gonna get into what's called a hard parse. In the hard parse, the first step is for Oracle, just like Google Maps, to say, what are all my options? How can I get from A to B? How can I collect the data you want? And to do that, it's gonna look at object statistics, system statistics, and then SQL profiles, if they exist, to build a set of options. How could I get this data for you? How can I get you from O'Hare Airport to the Museum of Science and Industry? Oh, well, you could get off here and take this road. You could take this and take that. Okay, you could go look at this table, do a full scan of the table, look at the, for this record. You could go to this table, go to this index, scan the index. Oh, and you join this other table. Well, I could go to the other table first and then do this table second, or I could do table one first and do table two second. That's what it's doing in this step. It's putting all of its options together. Then it's gonna generate a list uh, um, it's going to pick a plan and then it's going to actually figure out what is the, how do, what are those steps? 
what is the, if you want to call it like assembly code, how do I go from a list of steps that look like what I want to do to, hey, tell DB reader to go read file 17, you know, block 83, right? That's what this step is done. And that's something that we call like an outline, okay? So we go from a plan to an outline. And you'll notice here, this is where a baseline comes in. A baseline looks a lot like an outline. And then finally, we execute. Right? So we get to the same place, whether we're a soft parse or a hard parse, just the hard parse does all this optimization steps and a soft parse does not. And this is where we're gonna talk about bind peaking. So I mentioned a statement before, select for employees where employee number equals 10 and then equals 11. So what, you know, if we don't use hard coded values, we use variables, you know, bind variables are better, right? Cause now my statement looks the same. I get a lot of soft parses, soft parses are good. I've saved a lot of effort, right? And soft parses are good, it is what you wanna do. So now imagine I wanna look up all the, the quantity of phone, uh, sorry, the quantity of area codes in a particular state. Select distinct count area code from telephone numbers where state equals North Dakota. Now I'm gonna run the same statement. I'm gonna say we're state equals New York. Oh, there's gonna be a lot more phone numbers in New York than there's gonna be in North Dakota. And But I didn't change anything in my statement. I just changed my bind variable from ND to NY, but I didn't change anything else, okay? So that's where you have to be careful about bind peaking. This soft parse, Oracle's pretty good at this. If you give it the right info, it can do the right things. When you don't give it the right info, you're gonna look at that explain plan and go, well, it's the cheapest explain plan, but guess what? To go look up what might be 25% of your records versus 2% of your records, very different outcome of how much effort that's gonna take. And so that's why we talk about soft parsing and bind peaking, and, and I'll show some more examples, okay? So let's move on from how the optimizer works at the high level, and let's dig into a couple uh, examples. Oh, and how does an optimizer pick a plan for multiple generate? I should mention that I didn't specifically, it uses the plan cost and it generally picks the lowest cost and we'll show some more on that. Okay, so here's my example. I have two tables, uh, T1 and T2. They each have 500,000 rows of the exact same data, okay? And they have four columns, A, B, C, and D. T1, A, B, C, D, T2, A, B, C, D. And here's some quick examples of some data from them, okay? We're not gonna dig in too much. I just wanna give you that. And then mention, here's our segment size. They're each 16 uh, megabytes in size, okay? So let's jump to the next slide. So my first example, I'm gonna select basically a sum from these two tables, and I have no statistics on these tables, okay? So I know these tables have 500,000 rows. Why does Oracle think it has 160,000 rows, right? Well, the segment size is 16 megabytes and the default row length is 100 because I didn't run any stats. I purposely didn't run stats, right? So because it's not analyzed, Oracle says it's 16 meg, 100 row length, therefore I'm gonna read 160,000 rows when I do a full table scan. So I'm just trying to be very clear when people say like, why is the optimizer doing this? It's usually doing it because of what the optimizer has been given for information. Why did Google Maps send me this route? Because Google Maps thought it was the shortest route or the least effort or the, the fastest speed, et cetera. Oracle's doing the same thing. So I wanna give a very clear example. When you don't have statistics, it's not that it's making stuff up. It has some default rules. It knew the table was 16 meg in size, it does not know the average row length, so it has to use something. So it starts with 100. And you can see this, this is from a trace. Uh, these are where traces and things come in because you can see these details. Why is Oracle thinking this way? It's gonna tell you why it's thinking this way. And then notice that this drives my plan cost, okay? So plan costs are not these absolute things. They're things that you get to because of what Oracle knows. So here's a second example. I ran some stats, okay? So now I have stats on the table. Notice now it knows there's 500,000 rows. It has an average row length of 23, and it says there's 253,000 distinct values, okay? So I'm gonna do an index lookup this time. It thinks it's going to read one row, and it's gonna cost 556. 
big difference now, right? Suddenly it knows more about this, okay? It even knows the cardinality. See, here it says, I've estimated based on 500,000 rows with 253,000 distinct values that there's 1.97 uh, rows per value, okay? So it knows it's gonna, it says two rows, it thinks it's gonna do less than 1%, so that's how this cost comes up, right? Okay, so some good metrics, some good data. Uh, it's probably making slightly better decisions, but it's still not making the best decision in this case. So let's go one slide further. Okay, so now <clears throat> I ran and put histograms on this table. So now it says number of distinct values hasn't changed, but notice my selectivity. When I select a certain value, it now says, oh, you're selecting 49% of the table. So this previous one, it says you're selecting 0.000039%, very small amount, right? I'm selecting less than two rows out of 253,000, uh, 500,000 possible. Suddenly now it knows more. This particular table is skewed data, right? So it knows, oh, now you're gonna do 50% of the rows. I'm not gonna use an index. I'm gonna use a full table access because you're getting half the data and my full table access is this cost, okay? So again, Index row looks really cheap, but it thinks it's going to get two rows. I'm really going to get 50% of the table. Okay, so what have I not been telling you? This table of 500,000 rows, 250,000 and one of those rows, just, just over half, is a single value, and the other 249,099 are unique values. This is where bind peaking comes in, and we as a DBA have to realize if Oracle has the data, it's trying to do the right thing. We may be forcing the wrong plan. Right. So if I'm searching for a value of equals 10 and I want to read half the table, then I'm going to read most of the data. I want to do a hash join with a full table scan. If I'm searching for an individual record that's only going to return one row, then I'm better doing nested loops with an index lookup. Okay. But that's only because I know this data. And it's only because I taught Oracle about it by having histograms. Okay. If I didn't have histograms, the optimizer is going to make the wrong choice. It's the same with Google Maps. And if you've ever used the application Waze, notice Waze is giving me a different route because I said, oh, by the way, I wanna be there Friday at 6 p.m. And Waze says, oh, based on Friday at 6 p.m., you don't wanna take this road. You wanna take this other road because you're gonna have less traffic because I have traffic history. So I know more data. And that's exactly what histograms are doing. We're teaching Oracle more about the data so it can make better decisions, right? So there's not only one route to get here. And it's the same with a SQL statement. There's not a single execution plan or a single way to always do the same thing, right? It's very dependent on your data and how you're selecting, okay? Okay, so there's some questions about SQL profiles and stuff. We're gonna get to that. We're just gonna kind of keep moving along here. Um, but it's important to kind of understand, you know, the basics of what the optimizer is trying to do and how it's doing that, right? So that's what we're trying to cover first and we'll head into uh, the next part here. Okay, so the explain plan. What is the explain plan trying to tell you? Um, basically, it's those steps. So when I kind of give the analogy of Google Maps and you know, it's gonna say, leave the driveway, turn right, go forward 17 miles, take exit 13, or I'm sorry, entrance ramp 13 onto the freeway, get on the freeway, stay on the freeway for 25 miles, take exit 48 on your right, right? That's the steps of what to do for the drive. That's the same thing the explain plan is. It's the steps of what to do to get the data. I'm gonna to go to this table, do a full table scan or an S loop, et cetera. Some of these steps are generally better than others. There's no guarantees in these comments, right? And these are just, if you haven't done tuning, these are things to look for. I just gave you an example where a full table scan was actually a better path because I was reading half the data in the table. If I'm looking up one or two records, I should not be doing a full table scan, right? Those are generally bad. Uh, same with nested loops. Nested loops can be bad. So a nested loop is for every person on this conference, I am going to go run a loop through every contact in their phone book. Oof. Okay, there's you know 97 people on this conference. Each of you probably have 100 things. If I'm gonna give me your phone and read one contact at a time and then go to the next one, we're gonna be here a long time, right? Okay, so nested, that's why nested loops can be bad, but again, it's situational. Index full scans, think of it like a table full scan except on an index, can be bad. Generally higher performing items, 
an index range scan, an index unique scan, or an index skip scan. So an index unique scan, I'm looking for employee ID equal to Gary G. One record, one spot in the index, it goes right to that spot. It's pretty much the quickest way you can get to a record. <clears throat> a range scan, I'm looking for employees whose ID start with G. I'm gonna to go to the G branch of the index and scan just that G range, okay? Generally good, but then you do have to like, why am I looking for all the Gs? But you know, it's a business question, I guess. And then skip scan is, oh, you're looking for this. I'm gonna start at a point in the index. If I don't match something and it looks like I'm wrong, I'm gonna jump forward on the index and skip over stuff that clearly doesn't match. And that's kind of an algorithm. So um, table access by index row ID. Once I've done my index lookup, I now go look up the row, source row in the table because I have the row ID, right? And then these really defend, depends is hash joins and fast full scans. It depends on your situation. Sometimes hash joins are good. Sometimes they're memory hogs and they're really bad. Uh, there's just, you know, very situational. <clears throat> okay, so those are some of the things we're looking for in explain plan. So what's in an explain plan? Some of the same stuff we saw in the cursor cache, the SQL ID, plan hash value, the plan, the steps, predicate information. So when I said employee ID equals 11, or if I said we're um, employee ID in the employee table is equal to employee ID of the salary table, that's predicate information. Where something is equal to or greater than, or where I'm trying to find something or filter something, that's predicate information. Column projection. So when I go look at the data and I'm saying, I just want the first name and last name. If in the projection, it says, well, I looked at all the columns. You might ask yourself, well, why did Oracle look at all of them? I only asked for the first and last name. So column projection can be helpful. Um, and then finally the outline data, <clears throat> that was what I was talking about when we go from a plan to kind of the, the actual, if you want to call it assembly code or like what the computer is going to run, that's the outline. The outline is this, kind of internal Oracle view of what the steps of the plan are, okay? So to get an explain plan, you can say explain plan for, and then you give it your SQL statement, and then you use the dbms xplan display function to get the explain plan output, um, and we cast it to a type of table. Only the last query you explain will come out from this. You can also run this to pull any explain plan from cursor cache. And I have an example of that in the code, it's in the GitHub. And so here's an example um, where I grab the explain plan for a specific SQL ID. Here's the SQL ID and here's the plan. So this is in, uh, in the examples out there. So you can see this for real life. Um, the explain plan, you can pick what you want to see. The first is a basic plan, which just gives you some really little bits of info, right? Here's the steps for the plan, very simplistic. Um, if you, again, if you hint or change the SQL text, the ID will change. So when you're looking at that SQL ID, remember if you add a hint or a comment or anything that changes the text, the SQL ID is going to change. Um, another example, this one, I asked for more details. I said format all, and now you'll see that besides just the steps, right, which maybe isn't as useful, I'm also gonna see what Oracle thought, how many rows each step was gonna take, how many bytes, the cost, and possibly the time, how much time it, it thinks it's gonna take, right? So these are estimates at this point, okay? And that's if I do format all. Finally, if I run my statement, and I gather statistics on it. So these are statistics about how the statement ran. Um, I like to think of this as like a journal. I went to the Museum of Science Industry. When I left the airport, my car was going 25 miles an hour, but I ran in traffic and I spent three miles going two miles per hour. That's what this is doing. Gather Plus is gathering that journal of getting the data for you. And then you can get a plan with all stats and you'll see that you have E for estimated and A for actual. And you can see lovely things like this. I thought I was gonna get 20 rows and I got 20 rows, that's good, right? My estimate and my actuals came together. Um, 
And then you can see things like how many buffer hits it did and stuff like that, right? So this is a good way to check, is Oracle telling me the truth? So sometimes when I look at a plan in the cursor cache, it has one set of estimates, but when I go run the SQL statement, I get a different set of actuals. And that's frequently due to those statistics not matching the real data layout and uh, you know something with bind peaking, et cetera. That example I gave of looking up uh, telephone area codes in New York versus North Dakota, same SQL statement, but it's gonna have a very different effect of actual lookups, right? For one versus the other. And here's an example of that difference, right? So this is that same example query. Uh, and again, I think, yes, I have this in the uh, GitHub examples. When I run it one way, it thinks it's gonna get one row and it gets one row, right? It's a, it's a unique lookup, does the index lookup, gets one row. Notice this other example, it thinks it's gonna get one row. It actually got 250,000 rows. I had to go look through 250,000 to do what I wanted. But notice the cost here didn't change. And this is a, a real world example, buying peaking, right? Um, this is why just always picking the lowest cost plan without knowing what it's trying to do is not always the best answer, right? Because if I just force this plan for this situation, it is not the cheapest, okay? Not by a lot. Um, so this is why I want to talk about execution plans are not absolute things. Execution plans change. Execution plans could be different for different values. And the cost you see in the cache is generally based on the buying variable values for when it was hard parsed. Not every situation, okay? So a SQL may run better with different execution plans, and that's why Oracle gives us some of the performance tuning tools they give us, okay? Um, and I'm gonna go just quickly through those tools because we are getting a little low on time. Um, but everything's in the slides and the examples hopefully walk you through it. So let's kind of keep moving forward and just realize execution plans are not absolute. And so here's the real world answer for that question. I said this was gonna do 250,000 and now that explained plan is 741,000 versus 553. So now I think if you saw those two numbers, you would say this is not the better plan in this situation, but the default action of Oracle is to show you the plan of what's in the cursor cache. And sometimes you have to push a little harder to say, no, I'm, gonna, I'm going to flush the cursor cache, run the statement with this particular set of bind variables and get an actual explained plan with that explained plan. And that's when you realize 741,000 is really bad. Um, and if you remember a slide earlier, way earlier, I said the other plan was 1,853. 1,853 is way cheaper than 741,000, right? Um, if I told you that your uh, new car was $741,000 or $1,800, um, you know, you'd probably make a, a big choice there. <laughs> okay, so what to tune, anything in this process. So we kind of walk through the optimizer, right? You submit your SQL statement, it collects information, statistics, metadata, environment stuff. It generates a list of plans. It checks for baselines and it executes a statement. Anything you do in here is tuning, okay? And that's where we come in, right? Our job as SQL tuners is to know how to affect Oracle in each of these steps. Affecting this phase means putting profiles in or changing object metadata or statistics for the system or the object or changing optimizer environment variables. Affecting the plan picking part means setting up baselines. Okay, so notice the profile is over here in the, what are all my options to get there? The baseline is the, this is my favorite path to take. I want you to choose this one. But also notice that the baseline can't be picked if the plan isn't generated. Okay, so SQL tuning is the art of knowing these tools and using them in the right places. Um, we're gonna skip this one. And I'm just gonna mention here, this is where tracing comes in handy. So I mentioned tracing is that journal. So here's an example, that same statement, where it said, I'm gonna do one row lookup, but when I looked at the trace, um, I could realize that it actually did 250,000 in one row lookups, but it set the cost at three because it thought it was gonna do one, but the reality was different, right? So this is where traces can also come in handy. 
Um, if you can't flush the shared pool, maybe you can trace a specific statement and see the reality in the trace, right? So th this is where traces are helpful in your tuning process. See reality, see that journal of what Oracle did versus maybe what it thought it was going to do. Okay, so let's real quickly, we're gonna cover these tools and then we're gonna close out. Um, so there's a bunch of tools to help you tune SQL and I'm trying to summarize them here quickly and just so you know which tools are used and what they help you with. So the explain plan might run a SQL statement. It should give you some idea of the execution steps, but it won't give you details about the objects. Like, are there stats on the objects? Um, you know, are there, is this a view instead of a table or something like that? Um, is it a nice HTML report? Maybe. Um, does it tell you what your optimizer settings are sent to? No. Uh, are explain plans easy to read? Pretty much. And there's nothing to install. So this, are, this is not a bad tool. It's a good starting point. Um, but if I go down here to like a SQL T, a SQL T gives you extensive object information. It gives you extensive database parameters, et cetera. So you might ask, I've opened a ticket with Oracle. Why are they asking me for a SQL T? They're asking you for a package of information that can be shipped to them that has all of this stuff together. If you just give them an explain plan, well, again, it doesn't tell them, yeah, the explain plan says I'm gonna get this column from this table. Did it tell them the table had 254 columns on it? No. The extensive T will tell the, or uh, the SQL T will tell them it has 254 columns on it, right? Um, the SQL tuning advisor is a very interesting animal. It's a very cool animal. So some of the stuff I talked about, like, hey, if you have the statement in your AWR history or ASH history, maybe look to see what the plan was on Monday versus today. SQL tuning advisor does that automatically. When you push, hey, take the statement and go tune it, it's gonna look at all that history, it's gonna do a bunch of things, but it does this very automatically. So SQL tuning advisor, again, part of the diagnostic tuning pack, um, but it's such a good tool. It can really take what would take a person hours and hours to do in a couple seconds, it'll go do as much of that work. Now again, does it need help sometimes? Yeah. Um, so the example I gave the week before an upgrade, increase your top end SQL to 100. Monday morning, we're now 19C. The SQL statement's running poorly. When I push SQL tuning advisor, guess what? The SQL tuning advisor now has a week of the top 100 statements to look at, not just the top 10. That's very helpful for it and you, right? Um, so just realize you can impact the benefit of how these tools are because you're changing your environment, you're changing your settings to make them work better. Okay, so let's uh, just quickly talk through profiles and baselines and then we'll finish up. So a SQL profile is an object that contains auxiliary statistics on the statement. It's used during plan generation, right? So when I look at the Google Maps and it says there's many ways to get here, it knows the roads, the distances. A profile is other information that might help it, like, hey, six o'clock on Fridays, there's a lot of traffic on this road. Find an alternate route. Or this road is under construction. SQL profile is that about a database. Hey, the last time I went to look up that table, you thought it would take this amount of time. It took four times that amount of time. So you may want to rethink the cost of this. That's the kind of information that's in the SQL profile. Okay. There's, there can be other things, but these are just kind of high level examples. SQL plan management or baselines is the other end of the spectrum. It is, I've saved my favorite route. When I drive to work in the morning, I want to go by this nice little pond. There's a really nice piece of public artwork along the way. So I want that road to be included in my path every day, uh, no matter what, that's my favorite road, okay? That's what a SQL plan management is. But guess what? If the road to get to that road's under construction and I can't generate a route to get there, I'm still going to get you to work, but I'm not going to send you down your favorite road, okay? So profiles affect generating that plan ahead of time. How do I, what are all my options to get there? The plan management or a baseline is, okay, if there's a plan that is your favorite, I will lean towards it. If I can use that, I will. But if I can't, I'm still going to send you to your destination, okay? So... If you look through these steps, we're just going to quickly mention where the tools and these pieces fit in, and then we're gonna finish up. SQL profile, right here front. Baseline, right here on the backside. <clears throat> when we do an explain plan, we're seeing this part here, okay? 
or it could be coming from the shared pool, right? So an explained plan is just that list of steps. When I do a SQL health check, so if you've been in Enterprise Manager or you can run these command line, SQL health check is object statistics, system statistics, and an explained plan. A little bit more info, but still not, the, look at how much of the picture is not included when we're trying to debug this problem. A SQL trace is a picture of the execution. What steps did I do, right? So the trace is helpful, but again, a trace does not have an explained plan, does not have object information. It's just the diary of what I did. A CBO trace, which we didn't talk about here, but a cost-based optimizer trace, that tells you what the optimizer did during this whole hard parse. How did I decide that there was 50 options or 100 options? How did I cost them? How did I figure out what the uh, you know cost per disk read is, et cetera? That's in a CBO trace. If you want to see that details, that's that's what that's for. And the SQL T explain plan is the whole world. When you run a SQL T explain plan, you get everything. Okay. And then finally, when I do a SQL profile, I'm affecting the front part of this conversation. When I do a baseline, I'm affecting the back end of this conversation. When I do a patch, a patch is affecting this kind of source code piece. Okay. So that's the end. Uh, thank you for your time. I will do my best. Let's see what kind of questions are hanging out here. Um, if a SQL profile is assigned and fixed to a SQL, can the execution plan change? At some point, the table stats become stale. So again, a profile is upfront. It's helping the optimizer make op execution plan options. Um, it is not going to force a plan necessarily, okay? Uh, the baseline is there to force a plan, but only if that plan can be generated. So profiles at the beginning when the optimizer is making plans that could be, could be used. If the stats change, the profile is still getting looked at, but it might not affect the decision as much. And that's where things like a CBO trace can show you how that affected it. Um, how does cardinality feedback work? Ooh, that's probably a whole session on itself. And can histograms avoid issues in bind peak? Can you explain? Yeah, so the very specific example I gave, um, bind peaking is helpful because the histogram told Oracle when I asked for a record ID equal to 10, that it was going to hit 49% of the table. When I did record ID equals 1,000, it knew it was only going to hit 1% of the table. That's what the histogram told it. And the moment it knew it was going to read 49% of the table, it knew there was a better way to do it. Cardinality, <clears throat> that's your number of distinct values. And so if you look at the examples I gave, at one point I had no stats, and it figured, oh, there's this many rows, et cetera, a certain number of number of distinct values. When I had basic stats, it said, oh, well, I think there's uh, 23,000 distinct values, so there's two records for each value. And then the last one, it suddenly realized, oh, actually, there's 250,000 of one value and 249,000 of unique values. That's cardinality, right? And that's, it, again, it's very unique to each case, but it can absolutely help the optimizer make better decisions knowing that info. Um, multiple, okay. How does the optimizer pick a plan for multiple execution plans if generated? Buying variable information is stored with the execution plan as best as it can. Again, if it's in cursor cache, it's you know the last execution. If it's in a profile or baseline, it's the baseline you captured. It does keep that. <clears throat> um, my SPM session, if you go out there and look at it, it uses the same queries. It creates two baselines one for value equals unique and one for value equals 10. Those baselines have bind variable information in them. Therefore, it helps Oracle know that in this situation, that's better. Um, again, Oracle's doing the math every time it can, right? It's going, am I looking for 50% of the rows or 1% of the rows? That information is part of it. And when the bind variable changes, Oracle recalculates some of that. Um, there are lots of rules about how it figures that out. Um, but don't handcuff the optimizer sometimes, right? Sometimes we pin a particular uh, pro, um, plan or profile in and we say, don't do anything else. Sometimes that's the right thing to do. Sometimes you're hindering the, the optimizer. So that's why this is not an easy discussion. It's not, an, it's not a one and done, right? Um, I think that's most of the questions. I apologize, I couldn't get to every slide. I, these, these topics are always kind of big. 
Um, I don't know, Monica, do you want to pick up from here? Sure. That was an amazing and very uh, information-packed hour. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. I know there were a lot of questions out there that maybe he couldn't get to or that were about slide deck, information like that. So don't worry. Look in your inbox by end of day today for something from Katie Barnes. She's going to send you a copy of Gary's slide deck a link to re-watch today's uh, live webinar, so you've got that, and then also any links that Gary has for us to share with you we'll include in that email as well. So don't worry, we've got you covered, just be a little patient because we've got to wait for the video to finish rendering, and NYOUG followers out there, um, they should be posting things for you as well, um, all of these resources. So you should be well taken care of. And if not, you can always reach out to us and ask for anything else. Gary, thank you so much for all of that. Thank you. And I'm just so glad that everyone came ready to engage. It's always way more fun, right, Gary, when everyone's- Absolutely. Questions. Yeah, it's great. So thank you all so much again. Um, Gary, always awesome to have you. Looking forward to the next webinar with you. And I hope you and everyone else out there has a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Take care, everyone.